It's a great honor and uh, pleasure for me to uh, be able to introduce uh, Mary Ann Wolfe, who we had in the Kansas City Public Library, who I've been a fan of since I read Proust and the, and the Squid. But I will tell you this, I promised uh, Mary Ann uh, that I would give her the shortest introduction I am capable of giving. She laughed, as she is laughing now. Um, but you want to hear her, not me. Uh, so I will tell you very quickly, she's a, been a professor at Tufts. She's now at UCLA. Uh, she runs the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learning, and Social Justice there. She's the author of Proust and the Squid, which is a book about reading and brain science, what we know about that, uh, and, and, and what a two-way street the brain uh, and, uh, and reading are, uh, the development of the brain, the development of reading. It is itself <clears throat> uh, a mind-altering book uh, about the ability to read, the leading to develop thinking, uh, to, to uh, analysis, uh, to discovery, uh, and uh, uh, to aspiration. Ultimately, real critical thinking and reading uh, is relational, dialogic, uh, and uh, interactive. Uh, and I think she's the best descriptor, uh, uh, describer of that uh, in, in our world today. Reader Come Home, her most recent book, is about reading in the digital age, the positives and the negatives, which we've been talking about today, Marianne. Uh, social media is not reading, my view. I think her view as well. Both books uh, have Marianne's signature, which is that reading is not an act, uh, not only an act, but maybe the greatest act of aspiration of human beings. Ladies and gentlemen, Marianne Wolf. Thank you so much, and welcome to all of you uh, to my living room. My, my son's painting behind me. Um, I want this to be a kind of dialogue, if you will, uh, which is the nature of my last book. Uh, because I will be giving you a very particular perspective that some of you will agree with and many of you will have some discomfort. Um, and so I'm going to uh, show you my first slide, um, which is an unusual title, Information, Knowledge and Wisdom, an Apologia for Reading and Books in a Digital Culture. The heart of my work as Crosby, and I think all of us, all of you have as a shared mission, is an understanding that literacy is a basic human right that we must share across not only our cities and our neighborhoods, but across our world. And I want you to realize in my very short amount of time that literacy itself is being transformed. And even though there are very many positives, I'm going to give you a cautionary tale because reading, as, as Crosby mentioned, for me is far more than the Vonnegutty and Canary in the mind. It is one of the most important ways that our brain changes itself elaborates itself, adds information, and becomes ultimately an empathic, critical, analytic, reflective, not just reflective brain, reflective mind, reflective citizen. And so we have to understand those changes that are happening. And I want to begin with T.S. Eliot, um, who said something, always says something so important for us to think about. But this is a question for our moment in time. Where is the wisdom lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge lost in information? And this brought me to the thought of the library as Peter Briscoe in his small but very powerful book, The Bookseller, calls one of the most important, if, if you will, space-time machine in which we can go what he calls anywhere, microscopically, telescopically, past, present, and future, and especially into the minds of others, into the knowledge of others. But he goes on to say that the modern library, he laments and worries, 
is changing so that it is not so much about knowledge as about information retrieval and the inventory and con inventory control of information rather than the previous goal of every person in library in library science and services which is to provide knowledge as the basis of wisdom for all of our people and so i i hold that i want you to hold that in mind as a particular look at our digital culture and where we are and where libraries are and where museums are and it begins with the paradox we are all overloaded with information and i'm going to if you will give you a quick tour over how information may or may not be translated into knowledge and how knowledge is the basis of wisdom but not necessarily and so there are all the all these amazing people doing great work that i will not be able to quote for you today but that i want you to realize are dealing with the problem that is a paradox you would think that with more information we would have more knowledge but in fact how we absorb how we retrieve that information and use it in our own lives either becomes knowledge that is stored or does not and here we go to areas of critical importance for libraries what we are seeing in many reports is a decrease in children's use of books children as crosby knows a special area of, of importance to me there's a decrease in reading longer texts and there's brand new reports by Kerchick and Naomi Barron and Ann Mangan and others that we are changing in in the nature the, the, of our book not only in how long they are but even in the density of content well what is spurring that on in part is how we read and so my talk is going to be a lot about how we read because the medium matters just as most of you know, you read differently when it's digital. And yet, the libraries are spending so much more, as, as Peter Briscoe and Gerald Beasley from the University of Alberta are saying, our budgets are going more into the storage of digital books rather than the ordering of books. Well, what does that mean for the people? that are using our libraries and museums what are the libraries role in these big questions especially given their multiple functions i look at la where they are dealing with homelessness and all kinds of issues that one would not think that libraries must take on the responsibilities of the society which couldn't do it and yet they are but i ask you during this short time together to think about what the role of the library is in this big question of how we read and how we bring different perspectives to it. I'm bringing a particular perspective to it that you may agree or disagree about, but it's one that I believe is necessary for us to have a dialogue. So I'm bringing it as a cognitive neuroscientist looking at the brain circuit and how it changes according to how we read and what processes are emphasized in digital reading, what processes are emphasized in book reading. But I begin with a philosophical perspective that comes from the great thinker Walter Ong who said technologies are not mere exterior aids but also interior transformations of consciousness and never more than when they affect the word. Now what we have, especially during COVID, is a, if you will, a coincidence of opposites. That's what Nicholas of Cuse has said as a philosopher centuries ago. What do you do? We need digital technology. Digital technology increases knowledge exponentially. And yet it is changing how we read that information. What do we do to resolve it? Well, Nicholas of Cusa used the term, we take a stance of learned ignorance and we examine it. And I, I want to, as, as a, a prelude to the rest of my talk, especially for those of you whose funding budgets are funding much more 
of our digital world in books than, than, than our, our print books. I want to bring a comment I heard at the University of Alberta from their librarian at the time, I do not know if he's still there, Gerald Beasley, who said, the present situation between digital and, and the printed book is unresolvable until it is. We must be the guardians of the book's attributes. Now, I, I, I hope someone sends a recording of this talk to him. We have never met, and yet that, that, that is the reason in part why I am giving you and many other people talks about how understanding the reading circuit points us to a cautionary tale about how we're reading today. And it begins with a very important concept. Actually, it's the first line in uh, Proust in the Square, the story in Science of the Reading Brain. We were never born to read. The human brain doesn't have a single gene for reading or a single region. No, it is connecting the parts that were existing there, vision and language and affect and motor and conceptual knowledge. All that. It's, it's making new connections among that to bring a new circuit. But because there's no genetic program, that means that circuit is plastic. It's going to be changed by multiple factors. The writing system, the writing system of a Chinese or a Japanese kanji reader is emphasizing more the visual areas than the alphabetic systems. So we have different, even we have different kinds of brains, even within alphabets. We have different circuits depending on the educational formation. We have different uses of that reading circuit according to our purpose of what we're reading. I would never read any my email in any deep way unless it's an important something. We can read for different purposes. But the reality is that that circuit is not reading the same when it's reading on different mediums. So my, my work is to ensure that people understand that that original circuit is plastic and over time that it, it moves from this very basic decoding to a, a circuit that is able to consolidate knowledge when given enough time to do so. And here we move into what are those processes that are being elaborated? And I call them the deep reading processes. Those of you who studied literary criticism would call them close reading processes. But because I'm in cognitive neuroscience and I want to be more specific, I want to talk to you about what is involved in that reading brain circuit that we do not want to lose. Well, the first is that we are analogy makers. We are building from what we know and bring it as background knowledge to what is there. And the great Alberto Mangel, who wrote the, one of the finest books on reading, a history of reading, said, reading is cumulative and proceeds with geometric progression. Everything builds upon everything, but it has to be there. Well, there's another aspect that that Peter Briscoe quote was saying as a, the, that, the, that the, the, the reader is able to enter the minds of others. That is the nature of what is enabled by reading because it allows us to leave ourselves, enter the thoughts and feelings of another, which is the basis for, a, if you will, empathy but a compassionate imagination. It's like a moral laboratory we are given from frog and toad and Charlotte's web all the way up to some of the most important novels in your life. For me, I will simply say Middle March is one of the great ways that I was able to understand perspectives I would never have had. It's just an example, however, of how fiction enables us to take on a piece of consciousness. And the theologian John Donne used the term passing over. Books allow us to pass over into the perspectives, whether they're scientific perspectives or fictional ones. We're able to leave ourselves and bring something that enriches us. 
Now, all of that, all these deep reading processes that I describe much more in my book, my reader come home, I hope some of you read it, that's letter three. All of this prepares our brain to enter the most, one of the most important things we do with information. We connect it to the background knowledge, we make inferences, and we evaluate using our frontal cortex cortex our both hemispheres are involved in generating hypotheses is this true do we refute it because of what we know and because of what we infer do we discern the truth value this cannot be more important in an age of false information intentionally sometimes non-maliciously other but we are in an age in which truth is not being discerned in part because the entirety of that reading brain requires the time we aren't giving in digital mediums. Oh, there's many other reasons that are going on. And we aren't, that's not what this talk about is about. This talk is about how complex that reading brain circuit is, and it requires time to give its all. Now, one of the last things that brain does is contemplate and reflect. It's what I call the Proustian pause. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said we must hand on to others the things we gain in contemplation. Well, we have the opportunity to, as Proust said, leave the wisdom of the author behind to discover our own. But that takes time. And it takes time in two ways. It takes time to build a deep reading brain, to form it. And it takes time by us who have a formed deep reading brain circuit to use those milliseconds. They, this is never a given. Now, I want to use my colleague, Patricia Greenfield, to say something very important. Every medium has both its cost and weaknesses and its gifts. Our job, my job, is to really look at both and see out of this knowledge, where should we go? But one of the things Patricia is saying, and it's, it, it haunts me, is that the cost in the digital medium seems to be deep processing. Why? Because we have this plastic circuit that's going to reflect the medium's characteristics. And the medium of digital is fantastic for giving us rapid fire, massive information. But it's not giving us the set the way a printed book does or print does towards processing it in deeper ways. And that's where purpose, we can read deeply on digital, of course we can, but it requires intentionality and purpose. There are no binaries here. You are probably talking about all the benefits and advantages of the digital culture, especially in this time of COVID. I am not, a, if you will, talking about the past versus the future, the traditional or the innovative in terms of print versus digital. No, I'm talking about what are the cognitive, linguistic and affective processes encouraged or advantaged by both. And we need to think about what Sherry Turkle said. We transgress not because we try to build the new but because we do not allow ourselves to consider what it disrupts or diminishes. Both the medium and the purpose for reading are changing under our fingertips, and we have evidence to show this, that we are changing how our children's attention is being developed and in very different ways in that zero to five. Now, some of my colleagues from uh, pediatric neurology are doing images of what happens when children are getting the same story in print, which is read to them by their parent or caretaker versus an audio version versus a video digital animated version. There is no question the best activation of language regions is when the parent is reading the book, not when it's being heard, though that is better than when all the bells and whistles are just distracting and not even in our young encouraging their own participatory act. 
their own reap um, if you will learning to 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 establish this this the, the content in memory and so we have evidence in every age we have evidence in our in our youth that basically they are needing ever higher levels of stimulation they're always bored when they go off what we are talking about is 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 a change and we even have brain imaging to show that there are differences in white matter, the myelinization, the connective tissue, if you will, with increased screen use. So what about you? I, I'm most interested in children, to be sure, but I'm interested in you and all the people that we deal with. And there's no question that evidence is mounting that we are all becoming skimmers of information rather than the kind of immersive readers that all of us who who love books once were but it's and it's if, if you read my letter four you will see I, it has affected me as much as it affects you because the medium the dominant use of any medium is really changing the mode with which we read and so we're becoming these skimmers who do it like an f or a z we go zoop 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 we get these word spotted word spotting browsing uh information um, but we aren't necessarily giving the time to consolidate that in knowledge and therefore there are implications for the rest of the deep reading processes now we have children whom we've studied and we have had young adults who my colleagues in the e-read network are studying and when you look at what they are finding if they if 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 i can convince you through 171,000 young adults who've been studied from the year 2000 to 2017-18 i i hope this this data can just convince you of how important this is these all these studies it's a meta analysis of more than 50 studies have one and only one task the young adults read the same exact fictional story on digital or in print the comprehension is superior in print their ability to sequence details of plots and then you do a subset and say oh but what about the kids who are the digital natives at the very end of the studies they have even a higher superiority effect on print. Why for comprehension? Why? When asked, and what's their perception? They say, oh, we're always better on digital. Why? Because they say we're faster. Exactly right. They're faster at the expense of deeper processing. And so this meta-analysis of over 171,000 subjects is showing us that print it's better for comprehension when we look at different genres, and this is increasing over time. I look at another wonderful author, Italo Calvino, who said way before any of this was so obvious, it seems to me that a pestilence has struck the human race in its most distinctive faculty, the use of words. It is a plague afflicting language revealing itself as a loss of cognition that levels out all expression in the most into the most generic anonymous he goes on but the implications of whether it's a novelist an essayist or a psychologist or a neural imager is that we are are changing the way we read the results are and back to that information silo uh, information overload the results are many and they're so important for all of you to realize. When you have all of this information, the tendency is not to try to grasp all the different perspectives. The tendency, as we see in the polarization of our country and our world, is that we go to the silos that are basically confirming what we thought before. We are not using those silos with our full capacity of critical analysis. In essence, we are failing to grasp complexity by living in those silos of confirmatory bias. We are failing also to perceive beauty or to, to, to have that reading sanctuary that we all believe 
we, we once possessed, and I hope most of you still possess it. We can go back to it, which is why I called my book Reader Come Home. But there are such broader implications for society. If we give less attention to other perspectives, if we give less attention to others, we become more susceptible to demagoguery, to those who will mislead us with false information. When we talk this moment about democracy versus autocracy, we can do something about it by refusing to let this question of how we use our information and change it to knowledge and wisdom or not. We in the library sciences, in cognitive neurosciences and education, we have to think about how we can build a better brain, if you will. I call it a biliterate brain. I hope that you read about it or ask me questions about it, but it's never a binary. It's learning how to use deep reading across mediums. It's learning how to preserve what is best in our present deep reading brain and with books and expand it. And there's so many people doing wonderful work. My colleague Judy Koch and, 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 and her, all of her colleagues in Bring Me a Book are taking this question so seriously. They're working with the Rotary. They're trying to bring books as a community catalyst for literacy. There's what they call the virtuous cycle of book abundance. They're working with a beautiful app called Bookalicious. And remember, we're not only talking about printed books, though we, are, though we will always emphasize printed books, but we're also talking about digital books as well. But what I, what, what I really see from things like Bookalicious is they're trying to encourage, in this case, through a digital app, how do we meet the particular, if you will, level of reading of, of, of our children and their areas of interest and link it to books in our libraries, link it to public libraries, link it to school libraries, link it to publishers, but to bring books and give children choice and agency. So there are so many things that we can do, but what we must not do is develop only this, what Martha Nussbaum calls, this, these technically competent children who've lost the ability to think critically, to examine themselves and respect the humanity and diversity of others. Most of you have heard or read essays by Joseph Epstein in which he says basically a biography of any person ought to deal at length with what he read, he or she, because we are what we read. Well, I will say something that goes a bit beyond, and that is we are not only what we read, we are also how we read. For how we read and for what purpose depends on our knowledge that is now not readily accessible to people. This half hour with you is simply my way of telling you the seriousness of some of your funding choices. Like Gerald Beasley and, and Peter Briscoe, I say we must protect the attributes of books and what I will call the deep reading processes that allow our species to become ever more critically analytic, knowledgeable, empathic, and wise. I'm going to end with a quote. I've never done this before. I'm going to end with a quote from Reader Come Home. In other words, I'm quoting myself. I have to laugh, but I really want you to know why I read as a way, as a if you will, my last words to ask you why you read and why you have joined one of the most important first responding um, services, acts of service, professions of service to our world through museum and library sciences. So why do I read? I read both to find fresh reason to love this world and also to leave this world behind to enter a space where I can glimpse what lies beyond my imagination, outside my knowledge and my experience of life, 
to expand an ever truer, more beautiful understanding of a universe with God's footprints everywhere and to lead a life based on this vision for my students, my children, and those who will follow. So I thank you for your service. Um, and I wish you Godspeed in all that you do. Thank you so much. So uh, now I want to call our uh, panel up, and we have a very uh, distinguished panel. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marianne, for a uh, for wonderful, wonderful presentation and uh, kicking this uh, uh, part of our conversation off. Uh, first panelist is uh, Depeche Navsaria. Uh, he's a, a pediatrician uh, uh, with graduate degrees in uh, public health, children's librarianship, physician assistant studies, and medicine. A unique combination of uh, interests. He's an associate professor of pediatrics uh, at the School of Medicine and Public Health uh, and uh, human ecology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he has also uh, been very involved in Reach Out and Read. I believe is the incoming chair of Reach Out and uh, and and Read, uh, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, Monroe Richardson, uh, who is an old friend of mine from the days he was at the uh, uh, Kaufman Foundation uh, and user of the Kansas City Public Library, dedicated user, he homeschooled his kids. Uh, I like to think that the library was the place where a lot of that happened. Uh, Monroe is the executive director of Read Charlotte, a community initiative that unites families, educators, and community partners with the goal of improving third grade reading uh, proficiency in Mecklenburg County, and is, of course, uh, uh, partners with the uh, with many organizations in Charlotte, including uh, uh, the library. Um, British Robinson, British, thank you. Uh, British Robinson is the president and CEO of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. She has 20 plus years of experience in international and domestic health, corporate responsibility, public and private partnerships, and government relations. Uh, she served as, as the founding CEO of the Women's Heart Alliance and in leadership positions at Women for Women International and Susan G. Komen. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. So, Terry? So with this panel, we're going back to yesterday's format. We'll get to hear 10 minutes from each of them. Um, they have their, their light indicators down here, and I think we have some signs we can wave at you when you're getting to two minutes to the end of your time. Uh, so we are five minutes, whatever we got there. Uh, we will wave it. Uh, we appreciate you being here, and after we finish this section, we'll head into a break. So again, with the sticky notes and the questions, if you have things you would like to feed to your IMLS, table representative, they will come to me during the break and then we'll go into a question and answer period. All right, so I will leave it to you as to the order who would like to go first. Why don't you go first, yeah. Dr. Great, oh, look at me, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi folks, so um, it's really, really a delight to be here and um, I, I just have to say, um, Marianne packs more thoughtful information and notions and ideas and, thinking on one slide than I think I have encountered in entire semesters in uh, some training. Um, so always a delight to hear her, hear her talk. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I get the wonderful privilege of doing is sometimes musing on how, what, what I get to do in the different worlds that I inhabit. Um, I am a practicing pediatrician. I, I still do see patients uh, and all. I spent many years in primary care. Um, but I also get to teach. I get to think about books. I get to think about reading. I get to think about parenting. I get to teach about parenting um, and, and so forth. And it occurs to me that um, as, as Marianne was speaking, she hit a point about uh, where she was talking about how the parent reading to the child, right, was the, the best, right, out of those various modalities that were being being looked at. And we've known this for a long time, um, 
all over, and this is one of the reasons Reach Out and Read does what it does. Um, we, we work with clinicians to have them talk at the regular checkups that kids get in the first five years of life about the importance of shared reading. You know, um, people think we're a book giveaway program, and I say yes, but actually we're secretly a parenting support program, right? That's, that's the behaviors we're trying to change. And one of the things that we, we've noted and that I, I, I talk about is that in that parent-child relationship is, 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 is a whole, there's a lot wrapped up in there, right? And we talk about this in, um, uh, in pediatrics in general. There's a lot of work that's been going on over the last, uh, really decades, but I wanna say it's come together in the last five, five years about this notion of what we call relational health. Right. What's the health of relationships like? Not just the parent, not just the child, but the interaction that's between them. And how do we notice that? And how do we help support it? How do we help protect it? Because often it's going really well, right? So let's not screw it up, right? How do we help repair it when it's not, right? And thinking about all those different things. And one of the observations we made was that when shared reading is going well in a family, when we observe a child, so one of the things I do, we talk about this all the time, is you, the healthcare provider, walk in with the book in your hand, right? And give it directly to the child, okay? Don't give it at the end like it's a sticker, don't have the front desk do it, whatever, because you're missing a really, really, really critical moment. Your, it's your, your opportunity to observe what's happening, right? And when that little kid hopefully takes that book from you, studies it for a moment, and toddles over to their parent and holds it out in that wonderful read to me gesture, right? They have just told you volumes. My goodness, they've told you tons, right? They're saying, I know what this thing is that you handed me. This is that thing that if I bring it to you, there's a good chance you're gonna pull me up in your lap and we're gonna open it and you're going to do this thing called reading aloud with me and I want you to do it, right? And it's, it's a sign of not just familiarity with books and literacy, but it's familiarity with the act of reading, right? And, and a trust that if I bring this to you, I think you're gonna do this, right? It's almost like there's a button on the parent that says press here and I will read to you. Right? Um, this is like my kids knowing that, you know, I will buy them any soccer jersey from our local third, gen third division soccer team. Um, you know, like that, oh yeah, dad will always do this, right? But that's the thing, there's this trust, this feedback loop that happens there. So this notion of relational health is really central to this job of parenting. And there's a second and related notion that I want to talk about here for just a second, which is when you say, what is the work of parenting, right? What's the core thing? Let's get really meta about this. Yes, yes, feed and clothe and all that stuff, right? Really important. And so many families are challenged in being able to do that and, and they need help and support with that. But what is it that a parent does with their child when we say they are parenting, right? And, and anyone who's in a parenting role, not just an identified biological parent, it can be other caregivers, et cetera. I think of it as this world where we're helping them make sense of the world around them, right? That the parent is helping this child understand what is this universe we live in, right? If you've never seen a dog, then to have someone name this thing called a dog and give you ways of don't pet a dog unless you know, you're know you allowed to or that you've asked permission, right? Just don't go running up to them. Um, you know, other things about the world. And this sense-making goes on. My, I have two kids that are now in college, right? And, you know, occasionally they'll come up to me with the thing from my daughter from her Starbucks job going, Dad, I got this thing about a tax thing. What do I do with this help, right? Um, and I try to do sense-making, but I gotta admit, I don't really understand these things either. Uh, I say, here, let's turn it to the tax account and <laughs> here, you figure it out, right? right? But we're doing this job of this thing called sense-making. Right? And we spend our entire lives doing that for those that, that we care about and care with. I would argue that these two notions, this idea of relational health, 
of these connections that are happening, of the strength and, and ability of relationships to do well. And this notion of sense making apply not only to the parent child relationship, but they also apply to the professional slash client relationship, right? What am I doing when a parent comes to me and says, my child has a fever and a runny nose and a cough, help, right? Yes, 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 I'm coming to a diagnosis, right? But a diagnosis is fundamentally also about sense making. The parent is saying, help me understand what is going on here, right? And we sometimes discount this in all the you know, imaging and tests and blah, 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 and blood work, yeah, yeah, whatever. What is the thing we're actually doing is that we're helping make sense of things, right? And there's a relationship base there, I hope, based on trust. I trust that you know what you're doing, that you care about me, you care about my child, and that you're going to do the best thing possible for us. And furthermore, the last part of my, my thesis here is I would argue that this is what you do as well, okay? As you heard, I went to library school in the middle of med school, long story, um, <laughs> right? And I remember sitting in some of our basic library science classes and saying, hold on, I've heard some of these things before. I've heard them over in medical school. Of course, in medical school, we believe no one else could possibly know these things, right? I mean, <laughs> whatever, right? And I was like, wait a minute, reference interview, right? The whole open-ended, closed-ended sort of thing, right? That's medical interviewing in a different form, right? That what you all are doing or helping others do is to make sense of the world. When people come in and they say, I need a book, I need this, they email you, you're making collection development decisions, you're deciding what e-books to buy, what print books to buy, whatever the case may be, what programming to put on. You're contributing to this whole notion of sense making, of helping populations make sense of the world around them, and you're building that trust, right? There's a reason that libraries are held in such high esteem is that trust is still there, right? Because it's this idea that you're there for your patrons and not with some other ulterior motive or agenda or thing of that nature. Right, so again, I would say that when you pull all these things together, you start to recognize that there's more in these different streams around parenting, around healthcare, around libraries, right? That makes incredible sense that these are the same meta things that are, that are going on. To the point that I said once, well, if you take away prescriptions and procedures, I would argue that librarianship is merely a high, that, that uh, medicine is merely a highly advanced form of librarianship. So there, there you go. So uh, I wanted to offer that, to pull out that nugget there that I think is so important because I think it helps us think and maybe make sense about the world around us. So, thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, and thanks for having me. Crosby, thanks for inviting me. I'm Monroe Richardson. I'm the executive director of Read Charlotte. Uh, I'm gonna do three things in my 10 minutes. One, I'm gonna give you a little snippet about who we are, what we do. Second, I'm gonna talk about why reading and why I think it's incredibly important. And third, I'm gonna uh, share with you three evidence-informed ideas that I think um, uh, libraries can contribute to to, to uh, improve reading outcomes. Um, first, I wanna say, Reach Out and Read is one of my favorite programs. Reach Out and Read Carolinas and the uh, executive director, Kelly Bulware, is fantastic. It's been one of our very best partners. I love this program, has great bones. There are 15 well child visits um, between zero to five, 13 during the first 36 months. Um, I can't think of a better way to be able to reach families who in very high numbers take their kids to well child visits, even if they don't take care of their own health. So I, I can never fail to give a plug. Love this program. Thanks, um, I'll pay you later. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> Just give give Callie some more money. Um, so I'm going to try to leave you with some nuggets today. And um, you know, the first one I want to share is one of my favorite quotes. If you go to my LinkedIn profile, you'll see it. It's from Larry Page, um, and I think about it often in the context of our work. He says most people tend to assume things are impossible rather than starting from real world physics and figuring out what's actually possible. So for the last seven years, we've been engaged in the work of trying to figure out what are the real world physics of literacy. Um, our kids demand and need rigor, just like we would have with anything else. It's not ideas, our experiences. My experience as a reader is irrelevant. It's what does the very best evidence tell me 
that works for our kids, for whom, under what conditions, and how do we actually use that to help our kids improve in their reading. Uh, Read Charlotte is not a program. We, uh, I am part of the national campaign for grade level reading. One of 350 communities, we focus birth through third grade. Uh, I don't run programs, right? We are a capacity building intermediary. We help our partners in the community organize and work together. We work from the smallest grassroots organizations to the, the largest in our community. Uh, and we combine a deep knowledge of reading, both parts of the science of reading, how kids learn to read, as well as how adults effectively teach them to read. I would call this science of reading acquisition and science of reading instruction. We combine that with deep knowledge about evidence-based interventions, and then we focus on bridging the research to practice gap. We're big fans of improvement science, implementation science. Um, we also serve as an outsourced program officer for the funding community in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and in some ways, people refer to us as either a harbor master, quarterback, um, sometimes uh, field general, to get everybody moving in the direction to improve early literacy. Um, when I came to Charlotte from Kansas City seven years ago, I had two big questions. What can I know that other people don't know, and what can I do that other people don't do? Because reading is actually the most research area in academics, and people have spent millions of dollars um, think about reading first, billions of dollars, and we didn't see reading outcomes improve. So why do I think that we can do something different? So I was on a hunt to figure out what other people um, haven't figured out. Um, I actually think we found something. That's not the, to that's not the topic you want to ask me, I'll tell you. Um, but I will say to the point earlier that was raised around digital, the most powerful thing we found actually is digital, to actually guide the behavior of adults around meeting the needs of each kids, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, okay, so why reading? Reading, uh, especially by third grade, is what someone's referred to as a keystone outcome. Third grade is a critical pivot between learning to read and reading to learn. It is one of the greatest predictors of how well kids will do in school. Unfortunately, we don't have a, we have a lot of ideas about connection between prison and other things. Actually, there's very little hard data on that. Uh, I'm working right now with some researchers at UNC Chapel Hill. We got a nice longitudinal data set. Uh, the Duke Endowment is helping to underwrite it. Hopefully in the spring we'll actually have something that we'll publish and do in presentations later. So Siobhan, I've already talked to Ralph about doing a presentation later for the campaign. Um, but uh, reading really matters. It makes a big impact. And the problem is, and I, I want to take something that's often flat and I wanna make it round. So first of all, when I'm talking about children, I'm talking about children from zero to eight. Um, and so I wanna segment that. Um, some of the things that we talk about, love of reading and all that, I know that matters, but when we're talking about a six-year-old, the issue isn't, I would argue as much, do they love to read, can they read? Like they're, you cannot skip over the fundamental skills that kids need to learn. Learning to read is the most important job of children in elementary school. They don't teach themselves to read. Guess who does it? The adults in their lives. So either we are helping them or we are failing them. And unfortunately, we're failing too many children. One of my favorite sources of data is the National Edu Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, America's Report Card. I looked it up this morning, 2019. I was telling British this over lunch, I could have inundated you with numbers, but you wouldn't remember them all, so I'm just gonna, gonna give you two statistics today. In 2019, 52% of black fourth graders in the US had below basic reading skills. I'll say it again, 52% of black fourth graders had below basic reading skills. This is in your communities. Only 18%, one out of five, were proficient readers. So all the thing that Marianne talked about, wonderful, cannot access it if I can't read. If you want to guarantee failure, however you want to talk about it, make sure that child doesn't learn to read, and I guarantee you a high probability they will fail in life. That's what we're doing, right? So the question is, as libraries, is, is this part of your mission or not? Right? Um, there's more that I could say. Um, we, we have two systems in our community. Right? And the reality is, it has never been all about schools. Never been. Right? You've had parents making sure their kids can learn to read before they go to school. We've had private tutoring services. They're not there out of the goodness of their heart. There is a business model. They're making money. People need help. Parents are sending their kids. The problem is, it's inequitable in the sense that some kids who need it don't have access. Right? Um, 
impact of the pandemic, I think British is going to talk more about this, but uh, recent data from two weeks ago, communities and schools in Charlotte had their staff assemble in seven elementary schools. I think these are all Title I schools. The teachers are reporting only 14 to 17 percent of children in the elementary schools, all grade levels, are on level right now. This impact the pandemic. I looked at incoming kindergarten data from fall of last year. Only one out of five kindergartners in Title I schools on level for reading. That means they don't know their letters, no letter knowledge, no letter ID, letter sound correspondence, um, all the other stuff low. Right? Unless we organize ourselves, like we can predict with high probability where these kids are going to be in 10 years, in 15 and 20 years. Right? So the question is, what role does the library have right, in helping our communities? Because our schools are overwhelmed and they can't do it by themselves. And particularly the families we're talking about, the kids we're talking about, they don't have the resources. So who's going to come in and stand in the breach? If not now, when? Okay, so here are my um, three evidence-informed ideas. These are in order of increasing complexity. The first one you're already doing, I'm just bringing rigor to it. Empower the adults in the lives of children to help them with their reading outside of school. By adults, I mean parents, caregivers, mentors. Uh, 2015 study, okay, so we, we've long known mother's education is the most important predictor how kids will do. Did you know there was a 2015 study found there was one thing that co specific thing college educated mothers do for their children that makes all the difference? Anyone want to guess what it is? Reading three times a week. That's a malleable variable. Malleable variable that's not limited to college education uh, ed educated parents. Who can help those parents do that? You all can. You're already doing it. We can bring rigor. I got more stuff, but I'm going to skip over my time short. Google home literacy model home literacy model it is one of the most research proven ways that parents help their kids with reading right unknown research largely unknown right there's rigor this isn't nice to have like you guys have strong stuff you can anchor what you're doing around how adults are proven to help their kids okay number two all right this is going to get harder um Increase reading readiness at school entry. I think Pat's already doing that. I'm going to learn some stuff from, from their library. Um, here's the thing. There are four big things that we want to focus on. This is just literacy. I know there's a lot of other domains. But four, four things kids need, little kids, when they come to school. Letter ID. Can you name your upper and lowercase letters? Do you know the sounds they make? Can you write your name? And do you have big vocabulary? You do those four things, you're going to set them up. It will never be this simple again. Never. Right? This has to be within what you all can help adults do and help your kids do. All right, last one. This is harder. This is the hardest one. Get involved with literacy tutoring in your community. There is not enough, and districts are not stepping up. There are, in my community alone, there are tens of thousands of children struggling. Um, three big areas. Phonics, reading, fluent, comprehension. Kids need all three. Um, big gaps in the community, more schools that need tutoring, we need way more phonics tutoring, and we need a lot more of it to help more kids. If there's any one entity that can help stand in the breach, it's libraries. Thank you. Well, he just about taken almost everything I was going to say. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I think I'm going to sort of come full circle. Um, I had an old boss. I, I have a deep public health background. Actually, I've not been in this field, um, so I'm a little bit where the where the doctor is, and, and now I have a new new best friend here. But I want to bring this to ground a little bit and bring it back to. I think this has been a nice segue from the doctor and Monroe. Um, is to bring it a little bit back and sort of connect the dots because um, he gave you a lot of stats and facts. Um, and the first thing. First thing I need you to know, do not assume that every adult can read. Do not assume that every parent and every caregiver that's bringing that child in can read. Unfortunately today, 54% of all adults in the United States, ages 16 to 74, essentially read below a third grade level. That is 130 million adults in the United States. This is data, this is evidence. I'm not making this up. I just told you 54% of our population, adults, read below a sixth grade level. 
that has implications from the keynote we talked about, right? It can be a privilege, it can be a luxury. Well, it's not for almost one in five adults. Those parents and caregivers have to be able to read to those children. But when you see them, it doesn't mean that they can't, right? And so it's a multi-generational problem. And to Monroe's point, I'm just gonna say amen, amen, amen. Because you've been on the front lines from the very early days through the civil rights movement, through Jim Crow. We got another issue here. We got another movement and another moment. And I've heard a lot about, should you do this? Should you do that? I wasn't here yesterday, but I heard enough. As Monroe said, we need you to be not in the community, but also of the community. To recognize that parent that is low literate, that is struggling with reading, that is struggling to make sure that their child is not in fourth grade, is not below a third grade reading level. It is a plea that those of us in literacy have for you as libraries. Barbara Bush, our founder, founded this organization six weeks after she walked into the White House, our former first lady. And she did it because she said literacy or reading is connected to everything. It's connected to improving our society. It's connected to better health outcomes. It's connected to food security. It's connected to housing security. It's connected to jobs. You read below a sixth grade level, you can't read a ballot, you can't fill a job application, you cannot read a medicine bottle, you do not understand protocols around diabetes and high blood pressure, right? So how are you gonna help your child get on Zoom, which we've been doing for two years? We have a program, uh, early childhood, we have two early childhood low lit uh, literacy programs. One is called Teen Trendsetters and the other is Book Explorers. I'm not gonna go too much into it, but you can look at it online. We do an evaluation every year. The program is 20 years old this year, wildly successful. We get kids that are uh, two grade levels or below in reading, and usually within seven to nine months, get them back up, not only on grade level reading, but some kids a year or two above that after the program. We can always do better. The point here is this year during COVID, um, our evaluation came back and the evaluation essentially said that black boys were suffering the most. Even with this intensive tutoring, this evidence-based curriculum, we would posit through our researcher that it wasn't just what else is going on in the home. And this is gonna bring me back to the parent or the caregiver in a second. What else was going on? Yes, it was COVID, lack of access to broadband, you know, tablets, et cetera, et cetera. You guys know this, the digital literacy piece, that was a huge factor, right? So we have to take that into account. But the parent and the caregiver matters because you have to ask what is going on in the home? Why are those black boys, those brown kids below grade level reading? Because we haven't looked at adult literacy. When you have low literacy rates amongst adults and parents and caregivers, we're not truly fixing the problem. It's a multi-generational problem. And that's why in our actual name, it says family literacy. We would ask that as you go back into your communities, that you're very conscious, not just of the child, but of the parent, the parent and the child. As Monroe said, it goes together. We've been doing a lot, pouring a lot of money as a society and as a country, just into those kitty programs, and we're forgetting about what's going on at home. That kid, we also have data. There was a study of Boston, uh, Boston University, a study in Boston and a, Boston ten and a study in Tennessee. Both of these were RTC studies in the last couple of years. They were decade long studies. And they show that, the Tennessee study showed, Boston said, oh, it was wildly successful and look where the kids are with early childhood interventions. The Tennessee study showed something very interesting. They followed these kids all the way to sixth grade. Guess what happened? Right around fourth grade, they started black, brown, white, didn't matter. The, something started to happen. And you know what it was? We kept paying attention to the kid. Something was going on at home. They were food insecure. They were housing insecure. And so you sit as this hub in your communities and we need you. The second thing is we have good data on library school, after school, uh, some, excuse me, summer reading programs. They're stellar. The outcomes of your summer reading programs are better than when a child goes to camp or even better than when they participate oftentimes in school district programming. That's evidence-based. That's a good thing because you're starting to break that multi-generational cycle of poverty, of low income, of not being full parents, workers, and citizens in society. 
So that's something we'd ask you to reflect on and to think about. Barbara Bush, we, you've already talked about the mothers being so important. We know that 88% of kids under six, if their parents do not have a GED or a high school diploma, they're in low income or they live in poverty. So we have all these kind of social determinants of health and sort of all these other factors um, around the kid. And we ask that you take those in. Do what you do. Somebody talked about reading. We're just asking you to help the community to learn to read. And don't forget about that parent. Don't forget that it is a multi-generational issue and that's something we need to be concerned about. If we're concerned about society and democracy and economic mobility, reading is the through line. Reading and literacy are the constraining factors that if we do not fix, we will still be in the same place. And so that's, for us, that's the through line. We have actively, we've always funded libraries. We were grant making for 27 years. We're now more of a thought leader partner, a little closer at the national level to what Monroe is doing. But Barbara Bush, for 27 years, gave libraries around this country grants, millions of dollars of grants. In fact, her very first grants were after the election. This is a great story. After the election, she, they had money left over, the inaugural committee. She went to her husband, she took all the money, and she gave it to 5,000 libraries across, gave $5,000 to about over 100, 1,000 libraries in the United States with the leftover um, inaugural money. So libraries are in our DNA, um, and we've been talking to Tracy Hall um, at, at um, ALA, and we want to do more with you um, and figure out the best way that doesn't take you off your mission, but recognizes the moment that we are in now um, and that you are critical to us turning around the low literacy problem in America today that is reflected in one in five adults, but also in all of our children. So we ask that the biggest call to action is that you join us and know how serious the problem is and we can't do it without libraries. Thank you. Marianne Wolf, um, start us off. Thank you. Um, I want to say this with absolute sincerity, that it is with the greatest gratitude that I listened to each member of the panel. As some of you know, I think Dr. Um, Navasaria knows this from other talks, my entire life has been devoted to the themes which each of you have discussed. I worried that the talk that I gave you in in, in my words, which was an apologia for reading, in this moment in which democracy, in my opinion, is being threatened, I believed that was my goal for this wonderful group. But my heart, my whole life, has been dedicated to the themes which each of you expressed, and therefore my gratitude is truly overflowing. To Dr. Navasaria, you know that I have been, in fact, um, something of an apologist for ROAR for 20 years. I've given several keynotes for you, but the reality is that you represent one of the most important and powerful sources for the first area of the three areas I'm most concerned with, and that's the first area of zero to five, what happens then? And Reach Out and Read has played such an extraordinary role. I cannot be more grateful. Usually I have three slides dedicated totally to Reach Out and Read. Secondly, to um, Monroe Richardson, I could not agree with you more about the need for evidence-based practice. The second major area of my work and that I want as a campaign for the nation is to have early assessment, early intervention based on evidence practice. Half of my research is based on that and it is with pride that I hear about Reed Charlotte doing this kind of work on the science of reading for all our teachers and for your emphasis on tutoring. I could not be in, more, in greater support our appreciation. And finally, I, I have to say that I also could not agree more 
with the emphasis um, that uh, British really gave to one of the areas of inequity that has often gone under, under, underground. And it was brought to the fore by Jean Chaw, one of the most prominent uh, reading researchers, days before she died. She said the educational system must try to understand and figure out why the greatest failure in American education are fourth grade African-American boys. Yep. Why is that happening? Looking at the home, looking at trauma, looking at poverty, looking at inequity. But I also ask you, British, to understand that from another viewpoint, we are never, and this goes back to uh, Dr. Richardson, we never get fluency by grade four right. for so many of our children. Therefore, the first three grades are essential for getting fluency because grade four is the dropout. Right. From that point on, we are losing so many of our children of color, and even later NAPER results are worse than what you said. Right. So we are, we could not be in more, if you will, uh, on the same pages of your work. And I salute each of you. I could not thank you more for giving the talk that I usually give others and felt guilty of not giving. I didn't need to. The three of you did better than what I could have done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, and we, we have certainly felt all four of your calls to action, so I think we have some questions. Um, the first one might be more of a research realm, but it asks, how much of the tendency to shallow reading of e-materials is that most people do not know how to make e-books their own by marking them up with highlighters or tab-like markers to help you find your way back to important bits? I don't know if any of you would like to take that on. Shallow, tendency to shallow reading was how it was framed. Well, maybe I can start with, with an observation, and, and this is not my, my own observation, but is the work of, um, uh, that was articulated well by um, Naomi Barron, who Marianne referenced in a number of her slides. Um, you know, she talks about that there's something about the modality of, of ebooks and recognizing that there's not one way in which they're all programmed. But physical books, right, you turn pages, right? This thing we call a codex, this discrete turning of pages, this sort of a marker in your head when you move from page to page. You don't get that necessarily with ebooks. Often there's sort of the infinite scroll kind of concept. Um, and the argument was that it made it much harder for people to chunk or to kind of have a natural break in certain ways to process that. Um, and I think there's other elements of that, that that play into it. I think for young children, there's other elements also that, that, that are uh, key issues. Um, most, many e-readers are also do other things, right? And there's all sorts of distractions, notifications, there's bells and whistles that are programmed in there, which, mind you, are attractive to parents who think, well, isn't this better than a static, you know, paper book, which is far from the truth. They're actually distractors, right? Um, but parents get sold on this, that this is more educational. Let's remember, by the way, that the American public has no idea that the word educational is not a protected term. I could, I could take a fistful of grass and tell people this is educational and sell it to them for $25, and they'll go, OK, fine, you know? Um, so I think we need to recognize that, that there's a number of different factors that, that play into this. I don't know if my colleagues have other observations on this. Well, I can say briefly, there is, in fact, a whole group of researchers who are, who are doing work on what is called the shallowing hypothesis. And it's very similar to what Dr. Nipsarian and, and actually Naomi Barron and Meng and, and the eRead Network are, are all doing that kind of work. And the point is, the screen, even with notes, has an evanescent tendency to hasten this on and not take those notes and not know where we where we are spatially 
So there's an actual spatial element to memory that the book reinforces. But m most people do not know about the notation. So it's a good thing that as we move into the future, we are thinking, how can the medium address its own weaknesses? All right, I think I'll ask one more question, and then if folks want to take to the mics, we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, this question actually came up during the last panel, but I think it's relevant to yours. Um, what kind of literacy are we talking about? Do we have a common definition? Um, literacy. So, so I'll large. start. So first of all, um, the American Libraries Association has an incredible a white paper um, on literacy and the definition of literacy. Um, so I suggest, because I don't have it in front of me, I can't read it to you, um, and I don't want to botch it, um, but it's a beautiful definition of literacy, but it really is from, you know, sort of life from the beginning, because you're supposed to really start reading to your child literally in utero and when it's born, um, really to the end of your life. And if we're talking about lifelong learning, that's the space that we're talking about. And again, Family for us is in our name. That doesn't have to mean, you know, parent, child. It can mean whatever family means in 2022. Um, so we'd ask you to take the, the broadest definition as possible. And if you go back to what I said earlier, not just the child, not just the parent, but both. Looking at the space that you're in and how you can support that family unit through reading. And, and let me just add a corollary, something that I didn't mention, and Marianne, you mentioned. You mentioned the word inequity, um, and I missed saying that. Reading is about equity and, and, and leveling the playing field, more than leveling the playing field. If a child can read, if a parent can read, it changes your whole life. We have this line that we say so that you can be a full worker, parent, and citizen. But if you can read, write, and comprehend, you can live your life with dignity. Whatever dignity means to you, whatever that progress is, that might mean an AA degree, that might mean a PhD, it might mean whatever that is. But that's the piece that, in some ways, Marianne, you were getting at. It's this societal sort of compact, if you will. It's a recognition of that humanity in that other person. And we firmly believe, and our founder firmly believe, that literacy, as wide as we define that, and reading in particular, is core to having and living a life with dignity. And I tie it back to equity, because we're in this moment, right? We had. George Floyd, we had all these things, we had this reckoning, wherever you stand on the political spectrum. And we're all trying to figure out what does equity mean and inequity and that sort of thing. Libraries are all about equity. You've been about equity since the beginning. When blacks couldn't go to libraries in the Deep South and during Jim Crow and during civil rights, Carnegie built black libraries, one of the first ones in Atlanta, because it was always about equity. I think we're in a moment just the way we were in the 60s when we talk, when Monroe gives you all those stats and facts about black and brown kids, it's the black boys, but it's also black and brown kids. It's also poor white kids in Appalachia. Yeah. It is about poor white kids in Appalachia. It is not us versus them, which Marion, you talked about. It's all of us. And so we have to look at equity and literacy is inextricably linked and therefore reading and you have evidence, you sit on a platform that is evidence-based over hundreds of years that tell us that you are part of the solution as libraries and as library systems. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna go to the mic on the far side of the room. Well, you know, it's digital, so I had to talk. Um, <laughs> I represent a very large library system. 50% of our circulation is in a digital form. 7.8 million per year digital checkouts. Um, and I think it's great we're having this conversation. It's a great reset for us, because as I said yesterday, digital was our savior to our public, saying, what are you doing? We pay your salaries, what are you doing? And digital saved us. I respect the pedagogy, ped, ped, however you say that, behind all this. And it's good for us to think about this. However, there are two things. First of all, I really think we, the economics is part of the problem. If digital books were less expensive, libraries, rural libraries, there's, this wouldn't be a problem. We wouldn't be having to choose between print and digital. It just would be it. We would have both. It would be a good thing. 
because digital does save us space. It saves us rural counties such as mine that has both. It's, you know, it's, it's for people that can't get to libraries, whatever. But the other thing that I've learned from these past two years, hiring a, a DEI director, working through the, digi the uh, diversity concerns of our county and doing, we're doing a really in-depth study, is we do nothing about us without us. And my job now is to take the information you have given me, the science, and have it work with a community um, and not prescribe it. So in other words, go to my communities where reading is an issue, that love of reading. Um, where are you? It was wonderful. You're, you're learn, learning to, to read. How do you do that and not be prescriptive? Because prescriptive doesn't work anymore. Prescriptive does not work anymore if we're going to truly have diverse, equitable, and inclusive public library systems. So that is my comment. Okay. All right. We'll go to the mic in the center. Uh, I'm Michelle Martin, the Beverly Cleary Professor for Children and Youth Services in the Information School at the University of Washington. Yay, Beverly Cleary. Um, and I wanted to go back to, one, uh, thanks to IMLS for helping uh, me and my research team work on helping creating, um, through Project Logal and Project Voice, um, creating mechanisms for librarians to do more outreach with a social justice lens, with participatory design in communities, asking, you know, what do you need, and then going from there. So I'm grateful to to IMLS for the work that we're able to do um, at the university. But I want to go back to a comment that came up yesterday about that reading is a solitary act. Um, I also have a nonprofit called Readorama that, for 12 years, has been doing literacy immersion camps for kids that help them learn how to, as we say, live books. And it's all about using children's literature as a springboard for all the other activities. And one of the things that I feel when we get to the point where kids are talking to each other, sharing books with each other, and really helping to cultivate a culture of reading among each other, that is a level of success beyond the adults sharing books with kids. And we've also been able to pivot that to uh, online as of March 2020. And now we're piped into living rooms where we can also encourage you know, parents, little brothers, little sisters to participate in that. But I think that, um, yes, reading c can be a solitary act, but I think that there's a level of uh, success with that sharing and creating a community of readers that um, that is beautiful because that goes beyond what the teachers or the librarians or whoever are able to do and it, it, it has a life of its own. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to, sorry, where's the third? Sorry, these lights are blinding as I think everybody up here can attest. All right, we're going to go to the other far side of the room, Mike. Hi, my name is Greg Gilpin. I'm a professor of economics at Montana State University. Um, I study student achievement and the nexus of how public libraries impact student achievement. Um, the last couple of days, there's been a lot of information that has flowed, but I just want to articulate <clears throat> today of just how bad COVID has destroyed student achievement and learning. My wife's a first grade teacher, so I get to hear a lot. She's at a Title I school. Seven of 22 of her students went to kindergarten last year. 15 did not. 75%. Okay, and I'm, we're in Bozeman. It's a pretty higher income area, and yet 15 didn't go. She has four that are at reading level. Okay, so today what I want to articulate is just how much our, our house is on fire. I want to articulate that the whole ship is, is sinking and we need to do a lot more as educators and as librarians to get it back. Some of my research, again, is on the nexus of libraries and student achievement. I worked with Bozeman to tie those records together because I wanted to know how many books does it take to get rid of the summer slide. Sometimes my kids come home and they're like, oh, I have to read five or 10 books or 20 books this summer. 
And I was like, surely 20 books can't make up for 100 days of learning loss. So my estimates, you're looking into the hundreds of books for a child to not have a summer slide. So I think we really need to shift how we're viewing this. Like, we need to understand how public libraries are interacting with public schools, especially when public schools aren't in session. They're off for over 100 days during the summer. And where do they go? What do they do? And what are we doing? What are we facilitating? What are we allowing access? And, and what do we want them to do? So we did a Read 100 program where the, the superintendent said, you know what, kids, try to read 100 books this summer. I don't know if it matters if it's like number of minutes reading, number of books read, I don't know. I don't think that matters because I know it's a really big number that we have to hit. Um, so I hope that like we, we try to reach really high now because we, we're in a big hole that we need to kind of somehow get out of, especially for the K through three right now that have lost over two years of education. Like they're gonna be behind and it's scary to think about this generation of just how far they've been, they've fallen behind. If you were like me during the recession, if you had to work remotely, I, I, I wasn't a teacher for my kids. Like I had to do my job. My wife had to be a teacher, really tough. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, we've got a few responses to that. So um, uh, part of what I didn't share earlier, um, over the last seven years, like I've looked under like every rock to try to find things that people have missed. And there's a researcher named Carol Connor who in 2000, I'm so glad to see you shaking your head because not enough people know Carol who passed away two years ago, too early, tragically. I got to meet her before she passed away. I've been watching her work since summer 2017. It's the most phenomenal work, singularly focused on how do we effectively teach children to read. And what Dr. Connor figured out is that there's an interaction between children's reading vocabulary and comprehension skills and four different types of reading instructions. When I heard the last two comments, like I'm plugging you into what Dr. Connor taught us. So there's reading instruction that teaches kids code focus skills, everything from phonemic awareness through phonics and fluency. And then there's reading instruction that teaches kids what are called meaning focus skills, vocabulary, comprehension, and writing. And there's two modalities to deliver it. There's adult managed and child managed. Managed means who's guiding the learner's attention. And child managed can be individual peer work. So when you're talking about the kids together, I'm thinking, oh, that's a child managed meaning focus activity. But also, Greg, when I'm listening, I'm thinking the expansion and what we're seeing in Charlotte, because we're using what Dr. Connor created, this is what I didn't tell you all before. Um, look up A2I, stands for Assessment to Instruction. The company is called Learning Ovations, ovation like standing up, right? It's the best, this is the worst kept secret in reading research. IES has put millions of dollars into it. The director told me in December 2020, it's the best example of research to practice. Happy to share through Crosby what we've been doing. Um, but um, what I hear, Greg, is there's, and I've seen it from data in Charlotte, because we're using this, expansion of kids that need a lot of code focus. If you're behind, you need a lot of adult code focused, right? The stuff that you do around reading, individual reading, that's meaning focused, but there's an interaction between the four types and, and kids' reading skills. So the big challenge, and this is what tutoring has to solve, how do we get enough to the right kids in the right ways at the right time? How do we make shifts over time as kids progress? That's the big challenge for us in our community. And so the challenge of giving bits and pieces, you're doing some, some parts, the meaning focus, but if we're not getting them the code focus and we're not doing the adult instruction, the adult part, there are no shortcuts to the adult manage. There is something about, I don't understand what it is. I trust Dr. Connor's research, seven randomized control trials. It works, right? I've seen the data. But that's the big challenge. How do we get enough to enough kids? They need all of those. So the rigor, the work you do around helping adults reading with kids, dialogic reading, we call it active reading in Charlotte. We build out a program, partnered with Charlotte Mecklenburg Library starting in 2017. That's covering a piece of it. But we also need the code focus parts. And our kids, we're on fire because they need a lot more of it and they're really behind. And so that's gonna be the challenge for us. If it's not you, can you partner with someone that can help with the code focus part? 
where you do this, you've always been doing the meaning focus part really well, either adult or child manage, but they need both and they need to work together. That's our big challenge in front of us. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, if you will, reinforce. Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> I yes. Don't know. go for it, go for it. Can I reinforce exactly what you said? Not only do I do we all appreciate Carol's work and think it's been under uh, underrepresented, but many of us from a slightly different perspective are finding the exact same thing. But I want to emphasize for you, based on this research, we have found in NICHD randomized control trial studies that if you do early assessment, now when we talk about screening, we're not talking about over-diagnosing, over-identifying anything. We're talking about identifying, just as you're saying, Monroe, identifying areas of strength and weakness. Based on that, either tier one or tier instruction gives the appropriate emphases to the particular students. Only then, if that doesn't work, do we do intensive diagnostic work and give intensive tier three intervention. But the point is, we have found without a doubt that early, if you will, early assessment leads to targeted early intervention in which all those things are integrated and then some of them are more emphasized for individuals. So this is a new study we're doing with the Office of Special Education. I can't support more what you said. I th thank you. Um, these are wonderful. And I'd like to say that while we're looking at the house on fire and calling the fire department, we should <laughs> also be looking and saying, and is there someone standing there with the gas can that we also need to kind of, you know, take care of? Because when, well, because when I, to, to, to make sure they sleep with the fishes, yeah, no, um, that, uh, I, I, I grew up in New York, what can I say? Um, you know, so, because here's the thing, when you say that so many of these kids didn't go to kindergarten, and all the, the effects that have knocked on from that, I'm sitting here going, okay, what else is going on besides their lack of reading achievement, their lack of educational progress, et cetera? How many of those parents lost their jobs? How many of those yeah. parents are possibly not even alive? We know that thousands upon thousands of children have lost their parents in this pandemic. How many have themselves or in their families um, diagnosed or undiagnosed or undertreated anxiety, depression, et cetera? Um, loss of homes, you know, you name it, right? And here, I want to be really clear about this. I am not at all suggesting that libraries need to go and fix all that. When, because one thing I've been wanting to get up and say this entire time, and I figured whatever, now I'm up here, I can say this, is that I think there's a point where libraries need to say, we are not the right people for this. We can connect people with those right services, but if other people would just do their jobs, we wouldn't need to be the, 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 the budget social worker, right? Whatever. So, yeah. So, that, and that's the part where I say, and someone needs to also be asking, and why aren't we also putting in smoke detectors, et cetera, so that that fire doesn't start in the first place, right? So this is the public health model, right? Tertiary, primary, secondary prevention, you know, um, et cetera, that I think I would say yes to everything you said, and we need to be asking, and what else is going on? Because many of you are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, et cetera. You're not worried about your educational progress if you're wondering what's gonna happen when I get home from school today is, is mom gonna be a mess? Is dad gonna be drinking? Is, 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 because then we're dropping back into survival and who cares whether you can identify the letters at that point, right, from that kid's perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, I know we have a question on the side. This might be our last question. <coughs> We've got about four minutes left. Four minutes, great. Hi team, I'm John. I'm with uh, Every Library, the Every Library Institute. We do politics for libraries and policy for libraries. I have a question for a funders and systems perspective. Um, what do libraries need to do in order to talk to the funding community properly about their current alignments? Or how do we need to realign 
in order to be more attractive to the funding community. And a stub on that is where do you uh, expect to see us in systems conversations where we're not showing up? Can I, I'll, I'll start with that. I want to, to answer your question, I kind of want to go back to, I'm going to call you Mr. Las Vegas, Las Vegas library. Um, Mr. Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, um, that creativity, that marketing, that branding around libraries and their value add or their return on investment is number one. I think big funders, we just had a, one of the things we conceived of and convened is a national action plan. It's a five-year plan to reduce low literacy in America today, and we've brought in uh, academic institutions, governors associations, mayors, our peer sort of groups in the field. And one of the things we're looking at is the ecosystem. At the table, the American Libraries Association was at the table, in essence, representing all of you, because we believe you are core to the ecosystem. In fact, we spent two hours on fundraising. And one of the, the number one issues was, Mr. Vegas here, was the marketing. You've got to be in public health, um, I used to say, you've got to meet people where they are, but what does that mean? Where they live, play, pray, and work. I'm going to say it again. Where they live, play, pray, and work. And that's what he told us about this morning. Everywhere, in the bar, in the church, everywhere. And what's getting funded to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, we were how do we steal from the arts community? Um, the, the current director from ALA, right, is, at, is in the, from the arts community. And that's the model that I think we have to look at. You are part of the ecosystem, number one. So lean into that. And number two, it's a, it's a marketing issue um, to, to stay relevant, be relevant, but that you have a return on investment that I don't believe some funders truly understand and recognize. And that's actually why, bring it back to us, why you are part of this national effort uh, to reduce low literacy in America. We don't think we can do it without you. So marketing, marketing, marketing. This is a huge part of it, not the only part, but I just want to raise that so we don't forget it. Monroe, I know you have something to say. I can feel it. Well, I mean, <laughs> part of my job is working with the funding community in Charlotte. So we're sort of a quarterback, and um, part of what I do is put together high-quality philanthropic deal flow and then bring co-investors together. And we've done that for seven years. Um, at the end of the day, there's, I mean, it's the value proposition. I always say, as a, as a longtime funder myself, I'm trying to buy impact, right. right? So how do you position and market so that they can buy impact? Because that's what they have to do. That's what they're looking for. They don't do it themselves. They fund. And so understanding, um, you know, that intersection between your mission, values, priorities, and the impact you can offer and like your ability. And I'll just say as a former funder, I remember one of the best grants we made was, I made was to the Missouri, um, was it uh, College Advising Corps? Mm -hmm. It took two years for me to finally get it, right? And I think part of it was they just didn't position it in a way that I could understand it. I'm busy. As a funder, I used to say I was, I'm professionally in the business of saying no, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the, um, I actually had a venture capitalist help me um, when I was um, doing a pitch in Silicon Valley for a ed tech company I was a co-founder of. He said, your job is not to get them to say yes. Your job is to remove the reasons for them to say no. And so if the, if, if the impulse immediately say no, it's how do I peel that onion so I can get to a conversation? So um, at the end of the day, it's about they're trying to buy impact. And you're recording this. Um, <laughs> don't assume they know as much as you think they know. All right. Good point. <laughs> Enough said. All right. I think we might have to wrap it up, but let's thank our wonderful panelists. So I'd like to I'd like to start off to tell you a story that young man, boy probably just coming out of third grade, returns home to school, from school to his parents, and he throws his not very good report card down in front of them, and he says, okay, what is it? Environment or heredity? <laughs> so we, we, I hate to explain a really good joke, but you know, we, we, we've inherited a lot of problems as, as librarians, and, and, and I'll talk in, in, in one minute just a little bit more about the state of our world that we, we have inherited. And our environment in the library, in the pandemic environment, is of course 
incredibly difficult. But we need to grade ourselves on what we do about it, not, not uh, what we can complain about and, and what's going on in the world that limits us. It does limit us. But within those limits, there's much that we can do. And I think we heard a lot about that, particularly, I think, uh, in our last panel. The, the, second, the second thing I, I, I want to say is that uh, the, the proposition before you about our resources and how we use them and how we focus them is not an attack on the digital world. Didn't, I didn't get Tim to come here to do that, and I don't think he intended to do that. The digital world is a part of our world. We're engaged in it. I understand everything that Lisa was saying. Um, Maybe a little bit more difficult on the pricing side, but, um, uh, but, uh, and, and I've been very engaged, as many of you know, uh, as the chair of Shelby uh, after after Jenny, my my uh, my mentor, and all these things after Jenny's staff, uh, schools, healthcare, libraries, and broadband, the major advocacy organization working with Angela Seifer, who Angela, are you still here? Um, uh, there she is, you know, who, uh, who, who is the, the engine of the internet, I believe, uh, now. And, and so I think you all know that I care about the digital divide. I think it's very important. I also believe that digital information is a huge boon. It's mentioned a couple of times. The information flow and flood is a huge boon to us if we use it well, boon to the library world and, and, and boon to all citizens. Um, so I, I make that, that point. And I also want to make the point, though I felt Roosevelt's pain. I felt Roosevelt's. Is Roosevelt still here? Um, I felt his pain, you know, he, when we were talking about the many things we we're asked to do. Um, and, uh, and we are being asked to do things, and during the pandemic, incredible things, natural disasters, incredible things. And in the Kansas City Public Library, when I was director, we did all kinds of things. We were the center of the home, uh, uh, homeless coalition. Um, you know, we, we made eviction a, a, a major issue in, in, the, in the city. We did all kinds of programming. I'm very proud of our, our programming. And, and, and it connected us to the community in a way that led to, when we're talking about funding, led to the community voting 84% for our tax increase. So it also was pretty pragmatic. Uh, so I, the, I, I, want, I, I want you to understand, I come with that background and, and understanding in, in what I'm about to say and what I think we heard uh, yesterday and today. The state of our world is tough for everybody because of the pandemic. Bob Putnam and Shaylin Romney Garrett explained to us in the I We I framework uh, not only the polarization that we have, uh, but the huge economic divides, racial divides. Um, the, the divides in our, our community are as high as they've ever been. And it is not our job to solve every problem. We don't solve the economic problem. We can work certainly on the, on the racial problem. But one thing we can do uh, from an equity point of view uh, is, is work on reading. I mean, I, I do think if there is a takeaway from this, and if I have one thing that I wanted to share with you, that I, I wanted to share with you through our, our panelists and our speakers, is that there is really something important that we can do about equity in this world. The Biden administration is very focused on this. I come from a completely different political background. Uh, than President uh, Biden, but I share that with him, and I think it's a library world value um, that we can do something about equity. If we can do something about it, we should do something about it. And I think we heard today, I think from this panel and from Marianne, we heard exactly what we can do about it. It's not the same thing in every library because there are hundreds of different activities. We heard about a, maybe a dozen or, or two dozen today from, uh, from panelists, from uh, folks from the floor and from Marianne. And, and one, of the, one of the jobs of the IMLS should be to put all this together. Um, and to talk about best practices. It's what we should be doing. We haven't done enough of it. This is an inspiration for us to do more of that with your help. Well, you know, I talked to Pat Lisinski uh, after, and he's talking about a, a program that, uh, that he's doing with 200 volunteers uh, uh, in, in the coming summer. Uh, uh, doing, doing reading programs. One of the great things about the A2I uh, uh, program that Monroe talked about is that it can be done with volunteers. And where is the best place in America to generate volunteers? It's the library. We have connections to so many groups. The trust in libraries is so high. The third grade reading project is, frequent, is significantly based on volunteers and is significantly based in libraries. 
We can do this. We can work on this. We're not going to solve every problem in the world. We will not wake up in Edward Bellamy's paradise. Um, we, uh, we can, however, in our communities do more. And we heard from previous panelists, from, from Carmen and Diane and Felton, about things that they can do in their community, different sized communities that are transformative, that are extraordinary. But if we, if we decide that there's an issue we should focus on, and I think, I think this is the issue. I think reading is the issue. It is, after all, the traditional thing that libraries do. We are good at talking about the joy of reading. That was mentioned today. Um, we are very good about doing that. We are good about curating books for kids of all ages, of all kinds, of all backgrounds. We're doing, we're doing a better job, let me put it to you that way, than we, than we have uh, done in the past for certain kids. And we can do a really good job for all kids. So I think if, if, if we have a call to action, it is about that. I want to say that there is research out there that shows uh, and, and Bob Putnam talks about this in more than one book. Um, there's a man named uh, Peter Sharkey at NYU talks about this in our own reinvestment fund research. Uh, Mike Norton, I think, is here who, who helped us do that, that research. Um, shows, shows this simple fact. And it's a simple fact, and it needs to be delineated in much more detail, and there are a lot of people working on it. Uh, there's a, a group uh, represented here by Nate Hill who's working on uh, something called the, a New York Digital Equity uh, Project um, plan. I'm not going to get that exactly right. Por portal, sorry, portal, portal. Um, and, and the point of, the, of this research is that we know that the cultural institutions and the neighborhood institutions, the network and connection, you heard that, those words from Bob Putnam, which is, you know, his, his research over the years and so much other research shows that the more connections we've got in the community, uh, the better the community will function in all ways, all these ways about equity. And we know that, we know that a key to that is the library, particularly the neighborhood branch library, we know that the, the neighborhoods that Raj Chetty studies, where one, neighborhoods with almost identical demographics, some neighborhoods perform better than others. And the one thing we know about that for sure is that there are cultural and neighborhood institutions that are functioning in those communities. You are functioning in those, in those communities. And, uh, you know, we heard about so many different things that, w that we can do, but I will just say this. I'll end with, as I like to. Uh, with Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, w w the uniquely American thing is at the neighborhood level, at the local level, what he used to call the township level, that we can associate to, to deal with problems. Well, that's really what libraries do. There weren't, there weren't any public libraries or very, very few uh, real public libraries in the 1830s when Tocqueville was writing this. I think if he saw what you are and what you do today, he would say, that's the continuation of the unique American thing. Um, that, if we've been talking about the soul of the library, that's the soul of the library. And I think we can do this work, we can expand this work, uh, and it's the real equity work of this country. And so I charge you to go out and do it. And thank you very much for being here.